As rural Americans, we have a unique understanding of and connection to the land. Whether we ranch, farm, log, or simply recreate, what we do today determines our tomorrow. As stewards of the land, it's our duty to ensure that our children and grandchildren can enjoy the outdoors in a similar manner that was afforded us. Join the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Visit rmef.org today. Welcome to episode number 42 of According to Flint and happy to have, <clears throat> I'm going to call him a good friend, but maybe, maybe he does not feel the same, but uh, coming to us from a Motel 6 somewhere in the middle of Wyoming, eating, <laughs> eating crappy food from the lobby and drinking bad American coffee. Look at that. It's the one and only Corb Lund. Corb, uh, I should introduce you as one of the top three weirdest friends I have. And that's a compliment. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. I, I'm sure you, I, I'm sure you've got some weirder friends than me, but yeah, I won't name them. But I yes, most definitely. And I should say, as we record this, it's fitting and wanted to have you on as you tour across North America, getting ready to do a couple of big shows in Montana, Billings that's and right. Bozeman this weekend. How that's do you right. uh, Montana? How is Montana? Give me a general view. How's your fan base in Montana? It's one of our best. I mean, I, really? I personally like Montana because I grew up coming down there, and our, our place is just six miles north of the border. So I'm pretty familiar with, with Montana and, and uh, from a personal standpoint. But, yeah, our, uh, our audience is probably – that's probably one of our best, most supportive states. When you look out there – It's because I kiss your butt all the time and put you in my songs. Every other, every, <laughs> Am, every I, other in song. Am I in a song? Am I in a song? Oh, just not me personally. The, the royal you. Oh, how about how about that? Can I can I get in a song like, you know, the author C.J. Box? He's a the Joe Pickett novels. He's a Wyoming author. He takes people he meets and puts them in his books, like uses the name as a character. Not you know like Dusty Tuckness was one. Um, the, uh, what about? Could you hook a brother up? I mean, well, mention happened, me in a I song. I have quite a few uh, people that I run into in my songs, but usually it's because they piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> no kid. So, but do do they know? Well, their names in there, so I don't know. <laughs> Can you give me one person that pissed you off that you put in a song? Can you think of one well, off the my, top of your? My best friend Hold, Holdman in the truck song. You know, uh, he he. You, you know that truck got stuck song of mine. Yeah. That's that's literally true from start to finish. It's all it's entirely, uh, it's a it's a true story, top to bottom. And it, he was the one that wanted to go check his cows for twenty minutes. And I had a rehearsal that day, and I said, "Well, I got to make a rehearsal." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, it'll take twenty minutes." And then he got us stuck out in the middle of the prairie for eleven hours, and that and then he he appears in the song. Is that the um, song? Didn't the Hutterites get you out? Is that the one? The Hutterites. The Hutterites did not get me out. The Hutterites come along and they they say they're too busy to pull us out. So so they make they make the song also because they also piss me off. <laughs> those, damn Hutter, those damn Hutterites. Oh, dang it. Hey, can I can I take a moment and say that I appreciate that you took the time to enunciate my name properly? Corb Lund. Corb Lund. Yeah. Because you never know what the hell a Corb Lund is. You're proud of my shirt. I yeah, wore it. That's a good one. That's a good one. My my name is particularly uh, mumbly in a bar, especially Horrible. in a loud bar setting. Because if your name is George Strait, it's pretty clear, right? You know, or <laughs> or uh, John Smith. But Cor Cor Blunt, even my full name is Corby, which is more pronounceable. But Cor so that Blunt, is oh, so that is your your full name, Corby. Corby, yeah. But okay. for whatever reason, my my friends have always called me Corb, so I thought it was a a catchier name to name my you know my public music persona. Right. Or but, uh, I'll when I know when I say your name like Corblin, 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 what? Yeah, what? I know it's a nightmare. 
and as, and as you may as you may have noticed on the back of that shirt, there's a bunch of mispronunciations crossed out. Those are all real world. Those of all, every one of those has appeared on a poster or a marquee or a, a video screen. It's it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's, um, on the other hand, it's unique. There's no there are no other Corblunds out there, which I, is good. Yeah, if I search Corblund, I, I searched you, you know, just to get tidbits. There weren't any like Corblund lawyer. Corblund accounting firm, nope. none, no, <laughs> no, none anywhere. Uh, you know, ultimately we, who knew we grew up very close to each other it, yeah. it, in the scheme. I'm, I'm Montana. You're from can, can, Canada, yes, but in that scheme of how far it is up to the Sweetgrass Coots crossing in Montana into Canada, you're right there. We're, we're an hour and a half from each other. Probably. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That would explain our uh, mutual weirdness, I guess. <laughs> you know what? It, it is funny that when I go to Canada or I hang around you, and I'm going to do my best in this time today to not do it. When I hang around you, pretty soon I'm ending everything in a question. And I, I'm, going, <laughs> I, I'm going as well. You if I'm around apologize. you, I start to talk Canadian. Start to apologize too much? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, but I do think, <clears throat> you know, I got to think, I, I, I love having you on my show in Vegas. I love to hear your music, the stories you tell in your songs. I nod my head and that obviously that obviously Montana and Alberta are very similar in, in the, the ag background, what we see, the landscapes we see, we grew up with the exact same, that Rocky mountain front, um, and that's, it, that allows me to relate to what you're doing. And yeah, yeah it, I know. What you mean, I mean, I've discovered that, uh, like, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tricky proposition for Canadian artists it, because in the States, because uh, just because of the way that history has unfolded, like the American entertainment industry is just a huge, massive beast, right. Which is like, comes through all full spectrum media at everyone. Right. And so, and, and so it's tricky to to figure out how to uh, insert yourself into that while still maintaining your own identity. But the, what's worked for me is that I've discovered that all of the Western stuff and the Rocky Mountain stuff that I grew up with translates all the way down to Texas, right? Because because the the cowboy community is is you know as you know from rodeo is is a really tight knit um, uh, culture. And, and it extends all the way down the Rockies as far as far up as us. So it's, I, I found that's a, a good way to, to um, relate to people in the States because uh, they get that. And, and, and like you said, I, the culture where I'm from is pretty much similar to what, what you're doing mm -hmm. and, and down, all the way down really as far as cowboy stuff goes, right? Through my years of going to mostly the Calgary Stampede where I had the opportunity to meet a lot of Canadian country music artists. And then it's always cool to see them translate. It is a hard, it's hard to break into the business in the U S for Canadians. There's been a few, you know, Paul yeah. Brandt was one. I, I remember liking, I met him at Calgary and, and they're Emerson drive. Aren't they Alberta? Yeah. Group? yeah. And uh, Terry Clark's Canadian. Terry Clark. Uh, you're basically, you're my Anne Murray. <laughs> well, Ian Tyson, Ian Tyson is our teacher. Like he's he, our godfather. How does a guy, how does a kid like you, cause you're still a, you're still a kid <laughs> compared to you, Tyson. <laughs> compared, to, I, compared to you, compared I, to you. Compared to me. I remember 20 years ago, my mom going, oh, that Ian Tyson. Oh, <laughs> she did all time favorite. And I think yeah. that's why she likes you so much. How does a kid like you become so tight and such very good friends with a guy like Ian Tyson? Well, I mean, it was probably inevitable that we would meet because we're from the same area. He's only a couple mm -hmm. hours north up the Rockies. But he, I mean, if you're a Western kid growing up in Alberta, he, especially if you're into music, he's, he looms over everything, right? And it's funny because he he's had greater successes in his earlier years than than any of the other uh, country artists we've been mentioning. Like Ian, Ian's had his music recorded by neil young and johnny cash and like huge names right and and um so he he kind of looms large over the musical landscape in alberta and so i guess if you're gonna play and, and you may 
we should also mention that my stuff is probably a little more rural and a little more authentically um, Western than, than a right. lot of radio stuff. So if, if, if you're going to do that, like I did, it's probably inevitable that you're going to meet the guy. So, cause I mean, we we're, we're playing in a similar genre and we live in the same area. So I, I mean, it, we might've met and he might've thought I was an asshole, but, but it didn't turn out that way. We, we became good friends. <laughs> well, but that would be the natural progression. So yeah. I like I met him the first, the first time I met him was on a, years and years ago I, I was on a can we swear on the show a little bit week? yeah Gosh, no you're good you. yeah it's mine my name's on it yeah <laughs> um the first time i met him was i was playing at a uh a, a tribute a, a tyson tribute show actually and it was traveling around western canada with a bunch of artists and he showed up at the calgary one and and um and uh approached me and told me that he was familiar with my five dollar bill album and really liked it I was I was pretty scared to meet the guy because he's got a, a reputation for being a bit of a curmudgeon. So, <laughs> but he was he, he was really nice to me. He's been a sweetheart our entire uh, friendship. He's been great. You know, I should and should have from the beginning, but was going to get to this when you you talk about your music. I don't, you know, to me you're you're songwriter. When I think of you, everybody's got that title, whether it's entertainer. Uh, musician i look at you as a songwriter and you perform those songs but it, it's the old we play both kinds country and western you know the old line that everyone uses you talk a lot around me have talked a lot about western music not necessarily country because who know i don't know what country means anymore I, well i don't know if you know the history of that but at one time though there were two different genres and at some point in the 50s they say there was a dj who, who just slapped them together on a show and they became linked at the hip from then on. But, but before that country music is Appalachian music, you know, from, from Kentucky and, and Nashville. And it has a lot of Scots Irish influence and bluegrass, that kind of thing. Whereas Western music was, was cowboy balladeering and, and cowboy story songs, you know, like little Joe, the Wrangler and stuff. And at a certain point, those got crushed together and, I, I, but they're different. And I, mean, I like country music too, but I don't have any connection to Appalachia really personally or my family history. Whereas in my, you know, our whole family tree stretches down to Utah for 150 years ago, ranching. So that, yeah, you're, you're right. They're different. That explains, it does explain country music songs. You and I have had the opportunity to ride in the same truck together and, and it was not long, but so we were at a discussion. It was, I believe my daughter was there and a, a friend of ours. Did I give you that whole spiel in the truck already? The what? Which one? The one I just did about, about the, the, the uh, I can't, some on my show maybe, but oh, okay. I, I forgot, I had forgotten what the country part was. The Appalachia, that, that, it, that com makes complete sense. So it, it explains why you and I have similar interests in mainstream country music because it's more Western influence. I, last night, as we do this, I sent you a screenshot. I was doing some stuff and had Pandora on and everything that glitters is not gold by Dan Seals came on and I sent it to you. But yeah. really that's a Western song yeah, that's in right. essence. Yeah, and I mean, there used, be, there used to be a smattering of, of cowboy stuff on the radio, like George and Garth were the last guys to hint at that, right? Like, you know, Garth had much too young and 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 George had lots of cowboy songs, but but yeah, you don't hear any of that anymore. Just me, and Ned, just me and Ned and Chancy and Cody, pretty much. <laughs> Cody John, I was gonna say Cody. Um, yeah, there he's, is he's How, kicking butt. Oh my gosh! But don't you think that there's a craving for that? Chancy Williams is doing very well. Ned Ledoux, of course, has his following. Um, Cody Johnson is killing it, selling out stadiums. Doesn't that indicate to somebody in the business, somebody in a position of power that, you know what? People are craving this. They watch Yellowstone for God's sakes. Like, like it's a documentary. Yeah. People, people are craving the lifestyle play, craving the culture. Well, you've probably noticed, it seems like about every 15 years or so cowboy stuff gets popular and like, you know, back in the seventies, urban cowboy ignited it. And then in the nineties, Garth kind of ignited it and, all that line dancing stuff. <laughs> and, then, and then, and now Yellowstone's doing it again, but it seems like, I think, I think the cowboy, you know, aesthetic is eternally appealing to people. And it just, it's always there as we live that way. Right. But, but then every 15, 20 years, it pokes its head up into the mainstream 
consciousness and people really like it and re remember how cool it is right so i think you're right i think it's i think we're at a high point right now my, my shows we've been out for a month down the all down the american west and our shows have been it's been the best tour we've ever had after after covid i wasn't sure but but we've and every night i've been asking who's seen us before and who hasn't and i'd say it's about 60 70 percent new people so that's pretty awesome yeah it's that line you want to watch you it, when you have 70 percent new people you go what we do wrong last time that the people didn't come back, but you're also very happy that it's new people because well, of the that. Are, the shows are bigger too. So it means add people, new people are adding to it. So, so to your point, I think, I think maybe there is a taste for that kind of thing and people are excited about it again. When, when I do shows in different parts of the country, I can, I could tell you if you named a city, I, I go to as part of the PBR. When I look out in that crowd, I can tell you what kind of people are there. Like, hey, when we go to Kansas City, they're a real rowdy crowd, but they're also knowledgeable. You can kind of pick out the culture. What are, when you look, do you have a consistency when you look out from the stage? Do you see a certain kind of people? What is your culture? What's the culture of the people standing there below stage at your show? That's a really good question because it depends on where we are. Um, our audience, like in the, in the like big scale is probably... I don't know, 60%, you know, Western rural people, and then 40% urban people who maybe listen to Steve Earle or, or that kind of like Americana music. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real mix. And, and, and the blend depends on where we are. Like earlier in this tour, we did Spokane one night in Seattle, the next. So it's a whole, it's a flip. And then we did the next night we did Portland and then bend and then the after that. So it's a whole all same States. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spokane, Seattle, same state, different culture. Yeah. See, yeah, I got you. Like Portland and Ben, that's quite a that's quite a culture shock. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, completely. Completely. So yeah, I, so yeah, it depends where we are, but I would say I would say um in the in the grand scheme, probably half and half. Uh, and I think that's cool because I mean I, I obviously think it's great that I'm able to reach people who understand the culture I'm singing about, but it's also cool to reach people who who don't who just find it interesting i think that's good and i think it's good to mix them all into a big room together and drink beer and get to know each other it's healthy yeah well that's that's ultimately when when we start coming back from covid and we were selling 30 percent capacity in an arena that seated fifteen thousand people and, and people were telling me you'll sell every ticket like that people are craving seeing something i disagreed uh, I believe that people go to sit next to somebody they don't know, to spill beer on each other, to elbow each other and sing along to something. It isn't about what they're seeing. It's about what they're part of. Because now we're seeing there isn't any restrictions. It's out of their mind and they're going crazy. Yeah. So what you say about you guys are just throwing a party in a room and inviting a bunch of people to meet each other in essence. Yeah. Like Willie Nelson, Willie Nelson was famous in the seventies for, for having a, a real diverse audience. They say he used to have a third cowboys and a third bikers and a third hippie people. So I, 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 think, I think that's really good, especially in today's, you know, politically divided times. I think that's good for people to get into a room and have a beer and realize that they can have a good time together. It's healthy. Yeah. I like what you said about the different cities that are so close, like, like Portland and Bend are not very far away. No. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I had the opportunity, speaking of Chancey Williams, to get on his bus for a couple shows in Montana, at which I then had to get a new liver when I got back. But <laughs> Bozeman one night, and I think you'll see this, you're going to do Billings one night, then Bozeman. They were in Bozeman one night, then Great Falls the next day, which is more close to where you grew up. And I told him the night of Great Falls, I said, Guys, this is, uh, you know, this is where I'm from. I'm thankful you're here, but you're going to see guys in their wild rags and down vests and felt hats as opposed to Bozeman, which is completely different. And, and I, that's what makes it fun, though. That's I what think, keeps you going. Yeah, I like both. I, I like it's a lot of fun for me to play for Western people. Uh, it's also because I can tell from how much they sing along and stuff and the, and the knowing look on their face when I sing about, you know, obscure ranchy stuff or whatever you know yeah but it's also cool to introduce that to people who, who who don't necessarily know what i'm talking about and that actually that actually comes up in the writing because 
it's it's a tricky thing to write stuff with layers so that there's enough inside baseball stuff in there that you know people who live that lifestyle know that you know but at the same time <laughs> but at the same time having overall an overall narrative that's understandable to the average person even if they don't get all the subtle stuff cuz i remember as a kid listening to marty robbins records those cowboy ballads and stuff the gunfighter ballads you know i would get this most of the story but there'd be some lingo or some you know archaic uh phrasing or 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 uh, lingo that i didn't understand i'd go look it up and as a kid i was fascinated by that because i got the overall story but what the hell does that word mean now we go look it up so i i like i like peppering an, an understandable narrative i like i like peppering it with obscure or or you know inside stuff so that like i said the people that know get it and the people that don't maybe are intrigued see as you say that i instantly my mind goes to mainstream song no no it's it, because i think of mainstream songs you and i who know say rodeo in and out and there's always been like much too young to feel this demo jo george Strait, amarillo by morning he's had a few though left that phone dangling off the hook, then slowly turned around and gave it one last look. One of my favorite songs of all time. I'm playing Cheyenne tomorrow. Tonight, tonight. Uh, as we do this, yeah. So a lot of people love the songs, but you and I go, you know, those songs will reference something in the rodeo world, a terminology didn't, didn't, that we didn't get. Make, didn't make the short go again. There you go. <laughs> How many people listen to that George Strait song? So what the hell is a short, I don't know what a short go is, but it must have something to do with rodeo. We know, we know, and we didn't make the short go again. So I'm coming home or headed home, whatever it is. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I like that stuff. And you can pick out when guys don't know and it's not right. Well, Just you know, as you know, I read a lot of, about a lot of topics I, you know, I've got a song about oil riggers and I got a song about a grave digger and I got a song about uh, a, lot, a lot of military history songs. But, you know, I think that's really important, the accuracy, because there's a lot of people, I don't mean to d dump on urban people, but that's the happens to be the example that I've seen. But there's a lot of songwriters that throw, they like to throw like um, firearms references into songs and, they, and you can tell right away they don't know what the hell they're talking about, right? <laughs> I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but I've heard, and, and also rappers too. Like you can tell sometimes they don't know, they want to talk about guns, but they don't understand guns because of the, what they're saying doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> and same with, same with rodeo stuff or same with, it's like when you see a movie, if you saw a movie about bull riding, you'd be like, that's not how that works. And yeah, when I, yeah. when I see a movie about, about, um, yeah, the, the music business. I'm like, that's not how that works. And and good movies and good songs and good books take the time to make sure that stuff's accurate, even if it's not like military history is not in my family history. I just read a lot about it. But I made sure all the references and I interviewed guys and, and stuff and make sure that all the references and stuff make sense and ring true, because if they don't, you just look like an idiot and fraud. But if, you, if you're completely now. See, now you got me thinking about the movie side, but it's all the same, whether it's writing songs or writing a movie. A, a lot of times, um, you know, I, I, I talked to Cody Lambert about the movie Eight Seconds, which those guys didn't really like it because it, a lot of it was just a movie about a bull rider and they put Lane Frost's name on it. And uh, <clears throat> the guy that got screwed in the whole deal was Jim Sharp because I he was. Some, I can't remember what happens. In the movie, what? it's been years. What eight seconds? Well, you know the no, ending. No. It's that. Oh, anyway. Um, but Jim Sharp is not in the movie. It's it's Lane and Tough and Cody Lambert. Right. So Jim Sharp was with him the whole time, but he got screwed out of the deal because, right. as as Cody put it, Jim Sharp rode all his bulls and never said anything. Mm. Well, it wasn't very exciting, so they just left him out of the movie. So. I think sometimes if, if it's too accurate, it, it's boring to people. Like yeah, story-wise too, for sure. Yeah. But it's, uh, you can tell that sometimes movies have spent an extra, you know, in a, whatever, a $20 million budget, they've spent an extra hundred thousand dollars to have a guy sit there and watch it. Just go, no, 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 no. 
yeah. the, Spurs don't, the Spurs don't go on that way or whatever, right? <laughs> the consultant. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, just pay the extra couple of bucks to have some, whatever, whatever your movie's about, like have somebody just check it because otherwise people in the know will think you're an idiot. I mean, I'll tell you, Yellowstone has made ranching in Montana seem very cool. Like yeah, yeah, we yeah. kill people, we brand people, we take yeah. them to the train station and I don't even know where there is a train station, <laughs> but I, I always tell people if, if you really put a show on about ranching in Montana, it just wouldn't be that good. Cause our house isn't very nice. Their floor is always dirty. Calves die. It snows sometimes. Say, there's not enough, nearly enough bitterly cold winter scenes in that movie. <laughs> Have you noticed the wet, the weather's always good on the Yellowstone ranch. Yeah. Yeah, is who, I'm not sure who who is the uh, Montana consultant on that on that part, but <laughs> on the weather. And John Dutton is so powerful; his calves are born like 500 pounds in ear tag. That's good. <laughs> that's good stuff. Yeah, that's good. Bre- that's good breeding. Uh, you, you brought up your your crowds um, are the best that you've ever had, and it's post COVID, and and you made a little remark to me about i was worried people would forget about us if yeah that's accurate i you know what i was worried about was that through two years of not going to movies not going to concerts not going to sporting events that people would come to realize that they don't need it and we would become irrelevant ir- irrelevant it's a it's it's a legitimate concern i think yeah it is i think but i I think that they do need it. Like, I think, I think that what we do for a living is, you know, it doesn't seem that important, but I I think, I think public gatherings and shared experiences are really important for humans. Yeah. I, I call it the word I've always used, uh, because I'm a sports guy also was passion. What do we do in our lives without passion? And that's where teams come in. Music comes in. If you eliminate all that, which COVID kind of did, it is not a very healthy situation for society. No, no, I think people need sports and music and entertainment for, especially, especially in person. Right. I think it's, I think it's important for people's psyches. Yeah. It, I know I need it. It's, it's why guys like me, when people say, when are you going to retire? It isn't as easy as it sounds Yeah, because you have all these little things. Like you say what you want. You're sitting in a hotel as we do this. What, what town are you in right now? Denver. Oh, you're in Denver. And then, so you're going, you're making your way North to Montana through Wyoming. Correct. That's right. Yep. And, but there is a something really a a bug that you catch to be in a hotel and you're going to get on the bus and you're going to go to the next one. It is like being part of a team. There's a passion there for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun the gang, the, uh, the, uh, the circus rolling down the road is a thing for sure. How many guys, how many guys in your band? Just uh, four of us. And we got a crew guy. So it's just, it's a, it's a tight one. It's just five of us right now. The Matt, what's your band? The Matt Albertans or the, what's your band name? Hurt, the Hurt and Albertans. Hurt and Albertans. <laughs> that was a, you were a Hurt and Albertan. The COVID deal to not be able, because you do so much down here and even touring around and Canada was extra special on that. Uh, yeah. Not, not much fun during that. Yeah, it was possible to come down. It was just a huge pain, and it didn't make sense because the amount of hassle and the, the potential for getting stuck down here was too high. Because if, if uh, I had a couple opportunities, that I could have come down, but then if I would have happened to catch, catch the bug, then I have to quarantine for two weeks in a you know, hotel room in Montana, and, and, not, and I had things I had to do in Canada, so it just didn't make sense. Yeah, I really missed it. I'm really happy to be back. I love the American West. Um, so, okay, I, w- I want to, uh, I screenshotted something and I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you. Okay. Uh, by the way, you're the only friend I ever would have when I say, send you a message and say, we're ready when you are. And you say in two shakes of a lamb's tail. <laughs> that's, that's why you're top three. That's why you're tough. Uh, I'd I'd appreciate that. Yeah. So somebody wrote a review of one of your, uh, an album. Um, And and, and I'm just going to read it to you. He even has a song about the benefits of aging when it comes to certain tasks. 
he sings. I'm going to recite some lines here. I want an old, I want old men making my whiskey. I want old men singing my blues. I want old men teaching my horses because there's, there's just some things young men can't do like the old boys do. I, what, I, I mean, basically you're saying they're just old guys are just better at a lot of stuff. Right. So then they say, here's, here's the line. It had to be a Canadian that wrote this. Sure. These lines stereotype. They are not only ageist, they are sexist. The message is not hurtful to others, but merely expressed a personal preference in a playful manner. Uh, like many generalities, they have a ring of truth to them that only dissipates when you think about it. Basically, the person saying, great lines, couldn't have wrote it better, uh, but it is pretty ageist, pretty sexist. Don't you get sick of that crap? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, and I it's, it it's they compliment you. They wrap the compliment in a, yeah, but they're just covering their own ass, basically. Yeah, I think being offended is becoming an international Olympic sport. <laughs> you know, you know what I've been doing, actually, I hadn't read that one. That's kind of funny. But I, I've actually been dedicating that song to my grandmothers the last the last couple of weeks, because both my grandmas were uh, uh, English school teachers who who, well, who married cowboys and moved out west of the prairie and and uh, taught school in one room schoolhouses on the bald headed prairie. So yeah, I, I I dedicated the song to them even though it's called Old Men. But it's it's true. Like the ageist thing is stupid because I mean it's a compliment. I'm saying that older yep. folks, and and it's like if you think about it, our grandparents could do everything better than us, right? Like we're weak comparatively. Completely. I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I, I look around and I feel like those people that grew up in the 30s on the prairie man those guys knew how to do stuff they had to they'd die well yeah i had one grand i had one grandfather that was six five and one of the the greatest um engineers in montana and then i had one my other one was the biggest fittest guy i ever knew and lived in wisdom montana and cut wood till the day he died i, I mean so both ends of the spectrum i can't do any of that shit i yeah. can't do any of it there's a, there's a there's a history podcast I listen to called Hardcore History, and he the the host says he has a thought experiment. He says, imagine if there's two armies, and one of them is and they they're uh, they all have the same equipment, the same training, the same terrain, it's all equal. And one of them, one of the armies is us, and the other armies is our grandfathers, right? And they kick our butts for sure, right? They're tougher people. Oh, can't even, can't even fathom. So, <laughs> hey, when you you look out in the crowd, you said that that feeling of here comes that song here, here comes. Yeah. I it, it was slightly, even what I do, I look out in the crowd, people can see things coming maybe, but as a musician, which I always wanted to be, and that's why I'm intrigued by it to look out in the crowd and see people not just singing along, but that recognition, what a, it, it really validates what you do. It, it, isn't there a feeling even in every show you do that go, yeah, I'm right. Got him again. Got him again. That's the only reason I pile my ass into the van. And I mean, yeah, of course, that's the reason I do it. To me, to me, um, making records is fun and, and everything, but I've never really got into music to make records. The whole, the whole thing about music to me is the magic of the communication at the show. Like that's, that's the actual art to me is the, is the, the hour and a half. It's a conversation of sorts, right? With, with, mm -hmm. with, a, with, with a bunch of people. And it's, the language is music and and yeah that's that's exactly what i do it for it's fun what what's the one okay off the top of your head instantly a song that you know or that elicits the most recognition either yeah here it comes yeah they're gonna sing with it what's the one cows around is pretty popular <laughs> what uh you and i <clears throat> i'll get to that but you said when we're uh, you know, I keep looking at the clock because your bus is leaving. And I said, they wouldn't really leave you, would they? And you said, yeah, they could. But they'd have to find somebody else to sing cows around. They'd have trouble. <laughs> hey, okay. It's a, mouth, it's a mouthful, that one. Did, did, did when, before we went on the air, did I see the edge of your guitar sitting there? Yeah, yeah, it's here. Can you, okay, I want a snippet of cows around. Look at, I'm going to make you do this. Is, okay, I I'll don't tell, care. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I, I wrote too many verses for that song. Just, I tell people, 
I tell people I chose that when I write about topics I'm especially passionate about, I, I write too much. <laughs> so there's extra verses that didn't make the song on the on the on the main recorded version. Oh, so I'll, I'll play you those. How's that sound? That's a <laughs> hey, I'm good. It's an exclusive Rasmussen uh, podcast highlight. An exclusive that I've never got anyone else to sing on this podcast. So you're the first. You know what's interesting? I wanted to mention that our friendship is interesting because it's the only one that I can think of where I've spent more time with you like on air than off. I know. Because right? like we spent most of our time getting to know each other, either doing this or else at your show in Vegas. It's funny. <laughs> we ride the pickup we yeah we drank we drank beer that night in calgary after the nfr remember yeah three or four years ago and yep. then there's been a couple of truck truck rides late at night but beyond that it's mostly been uh in the public eye it's an interesting uh way to develop a friendship <laughs> <laughs> but i do let you swear so that's good that's on true. this one yeah all right here we go okay here's the new verse what else is gonna make your pony puff and wheeze? Or make you calve them out at below 40 degrees? What else is gonna eat you right completely out of feeling? You always have cows around. Okay, this is my favorite. Well, you'd never get to see your banker otherwise. You'd never get to fix no fence or hang no barbed wires or have some mangy neighbors bull breed the heifers that you prize. Man, you always have cows around. Well, everything is better with some cows around. Living in town sometimes brings me down. Let me bestow this western blessing and leave you cattle bound. May you always have cows around. What kind, Corb? No, what kind of cows? What kind of cows should we have around? You know, you know what I've been getting getting off on lately is making people say it in Spanish. <laughs> Does anybody, anyone speak Spanish? Can anyone ask anyone ask me in Spanish? I think it's it's uh qui tipos de vacas. Qui tipos de vacas, Corb. Every once in a while somebody gets it in Spanish, it makes me happy. <laughs> Don't you recite like every freaking kind of cow? That, well, not everyone, but all the ones well, I can think of at the moment. I think it's uh, well, there's Herford, Highland, Simmons, all West, Black, and Maine, and Jew. He and he, no limbs in short horn, Charlie, what to do? Texas, Longhorn, Corey, any Roman, Yola, Galloway, and Angus, Bravo, Brangus, Jersey, Guernsey, Holstein. Hey. <laughs> And you know, you know what I've discovered is if, if you write a song where you list as many calories as you can and you miss one, you never oh, hear the end of it. Never. So many about, emails. Yeah. What about like, the Aussies, especially because there's a bunch of Aussie breeds I'm not too familiar with, but they, they, they give me shit about it all the time. <laughs> I can imagine. No matter how hard you try to make everybody happy. Literally, know. literally last night in Denver, somebody was grinding my gears about some northern Italian breed I've never heard of. So yeah, you, just, you, you get, they get passionate about that stuff. Let me give you an out on that. Tell, just tell them it didn't rhyme with anything. Yeah, I couldn't rhyme right. it. Yeah, I couldn't. It's rhyme. like it's like rhyming with orange. Nothing rhymes with orange. Door hinge. <laughs> so what? Uh, as you make your way up, what what are you guys touring wise? You, you got a couple in Montana. Are you? What's it look like future? Are, are you um, going strong still? Cheyenne, Laramie, Casper. Uh, Helena Bozeman Billings, and then we do Canada for five or six weeks, and then we come back down to Texas. We're um, making up a lot of time. Yeah, well, and that's good. Uh, have you held up okay? I, I, I did have a talk last summer at Cheyenne with uh, with Cody Johnson and his management, and they were so anxious to get back to work that they went, "Let's go." Two weeks in, he had to take some shows off because his his throat was bad. You and I have had this discussion. I've been battling. Uh, vocal issues for the last two, three weeks. Um, it is something you got to keep in shape. And if sickness sets in, did you recently miss a show? What were yeah. you sick or somebody in your band? What was going on? Can you I tell? Caught, I caught a really bad head cold. It wasn't COVID. I tested myself and I've, I've had COVID twice already, but yeah, it was just a, a throat, a sore throat thing. And I had to cancel one show, but I got, uh, it was good. I did. Cause, cause I bounced back pretty quick. I've had it before. I've had 
I couldn't sing for a number of nights, but it was just the one night. And then I had a couple of rough ones, but I got through them, but now I'm fine again. That's an then, obstacle though. It, that's, I can limp through it because I'm not singing. Yeah, I can get by. What do you do? It's tough thinking that our whole operation hinges on, you know, about an inch long vocal fold, you know, because if that goes bad, the whole thing grinds to a halt. Um, yeah, I just, the biggest thing is just lots of sleep and drink water. And in a pinch, I've done this a couple of times in my life. I don't like to do it much, but there's a particular steroid you can get from the doctor that it's an anti-inflammatory that, because when you can't, when you can't use your vocal cords, it's because they're inflamed. And so there's a really effective steroid called, it, it starts with the P, um, prednisone, I think it's called. Prednisone, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a real effective, uh, if you, if you, if there's a really important show you got to play and you can't sing, you go to the doctor and you hook you up with that, but it's, it, you want to use it sparingly. And you also have to be careful because all of a sudden it feels like you can sing like a bird, but it's like, it's like playing, playing football hurt, you know, when you've got a shot and you can't feel your injury, you can hurt it worse. So, but Listen, uh, yeah. I can sing like a bird, but it's, a, actually, it, I was surprised but, that night you were driving around singing all the glitters you jumped in on a harmony. I was like, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> I sing like a bird, but it's kind of an old, ugly bird. Is it? <laughs> like, a, like a raven? It's a raven. I do some weddings and funerals. Like We'll have to get together. My brother, Will, plays the guitar very well, and we sing. We sing. My sister sings very well. My brother, Will. Now, my brother, Pete, not much. He, yeah. Not much. But I don't know. I, I just, I feel bad. I've said this before. I feel bad for people who music is not any part of their life because music I've talked about this with other guys on this, on this show, it has to capture an emotion that Mark Wills taught me that, that notice I'd name drop Garth Brooks told me never to name drop, but um, (laughs) it's got to elicit an emotion. And to me, that's what's wrong with a lot of quote unquote country music is the emotion. What is the emotion it's grabbing from you? Is it that I want to sit on a tailgate? Is it the cutoffs the girl has on? To me, it's it's got to grab an emotion of some sort, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, what you're talking about with with radio radio country music, it, it, I think that's just a function of corporate corporatism. You know, it, it's it's the same as would you rather have a pair of handmade boots or a pair of Nike runners that were made in an Asian sweatshop? Right? It's the same thing. It's a it's easier to market generic pablum than it is to market you know unique art and so it's just the structure of the way the world is that that's why we ended up with music on the radio that we did so the key to it is just to you know it's the same as would you rather have a mcdonald's hamburger or a grass-fed steak right it's just easier to market the hamburger Mm. and sometimes sometimes it's okay to live sometimes it's okay to eat that hamburger it's like listening to a crappy song (laughs) it's not satisfying right in the long term yeah. So it's just it's just a matter of, you know, if you if you decide that you like, you know, more art, artistic or more musical with more depth, better. You just have to seek it out. It's not you're not going to find it on the radio, AM radio dial usually anymore. Right. And, and to so much of the public success in the radio in the music business is, ooh, he's on the radio. Ooh, that's on the radio. And there's so many people. Like I said, I've said this a lot. I've really fallen in love with that music that isn't regularly on the radio. You know, I like the Aaron Watson and Chansey and you and Ned Ledoux. I mean, they're, they're everywhere out there. Um, there's a whole culture of it, but, and that isn't being on the radio is not success in not that in within the music business is not determined. If you're on the radio, you have your own reward and your own crowd and, and what you are satisfied doing. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I've always been on the fringes, so I've never, I've never really measured myself by mainstream radio success because I knew that wasn't going to happen anyway. It's just not what I do. So, um, yeah, that's right. The, the good news is, though, you know, in the last 15 years, things have changed so much technologically that the it's the same thing, you know, when you hear about Joe Rogan getting 10 million downloads and CNN getting 400,000 viewers. It's like it's it's slowly the what would you call it? The democratization of music is slowly chipping away at, at the stranglehold that the mainstream radio has on listenership because there's, there's a really vibrant underground scene. Now all the artists you mentioned, and then there's a whole like Texas country scene and there's mm-hmm. a yeah. Americana scene and there's all kinds of, you know, underground country of different stripes that that's really flourishing 
you know, Tyler Childers and Coulter Wall and there's tons of Hayes Carl, there's tons of them. And, and it's uh, Turnpike Troubadours. And, and it's, it's actually a really positive time because none of those people are on the mainstream radio, but they're super popular and it's becoming easier and easier to get your music out through alternative platforms besides the mainstream AM radio, which is really, really good. It, yeah. Interestingly, I, I just rode 1200 miles hauling horses home from Arizona with my 23 year old daughter. And she just puts her phone on and we listen to her music. Yeah. And it reminds me, as you were saying all those names, Logan, who runs my stuff here, he's 22 years old. He was nodding at all those names yeah. that, uh, you know, that so much access to that, that wasn't there before. I mean, look, am I right in, in this Morgan Wallen gets canceled for something he said, well, we're not playing him on the radio. We're not this goes ahead and is more successful than he's ever been. Okay. He didn't need it. He didn't need radio. Yeah. I think, I think the world is, is slowly, uh, decentralizing away from away from those kinds of things so i i in terms of like because for a while there mainstream radio has had a like they in the old days it was better because there's all these independent radio stations and they would play whatever they liked whatever the dj had discovered but then in the last few decades there's been a consolidation of ownership of all the radio stations there's yeah. only one or two big corporations that own all the radio stations so they send down the playlist from the headquarters and everybody has to play the same stuff right so that's i think i think that what's happening now with with a, the underground stuff is a reaction to that because people are sick of hearing the same 10 songs all day long so they're all <laughs> they're they're discovering other whether it's streaming or or yeah. uh, you know, serious, serious, uh, serious radio, satellite radio. There's a lot. There's so many more outlets now that that people like me who operate on the fringes have a have a more tools at our disposal. Yeah, and guy like Aaron Watson, an independent artist, steps up and gets a top ten hit on mainstream radio, and they never play him again because yeah, the record great. company yeah. said, "I'm not yeah. going to do that anymore." <laughs> so, but I mean, at a certain point, I, all I care about is having people in my shows. Like, I don't right. care about sales numbers or anything i just I'll, the only the only reason i'm in this is to play so songs for people live so the only purpose of records for me is to get them to the show and well i mean i want them to enjoy the records too but but uh yeah it's all about playing for people live for me so that's all like that's the only metric i use is how many people are at shows yeah well i can tell you this i've been to the i've been to shows uh you're at pub station in billings you're at the elm i believe in bozeman and from a Montana guy, those are great venues to play. They're so yeah. uh, great one. The Elman Bozeman, that's new. That, that's a that's a good one. It'll be awesome. I don't, I don't think I've been there. It's cool. It's uh, it, it's a great facility for what you are doing. I was there with Chansey, and for what you're doing, I think it'll be great. Which which brings me to the reason I had you on this podcast is I want you to leave my girls tickets. My daughter's <laughs> so, so we just talked all this time and really that's all I wanted was my girls. <laughs> you could just text me Flint. Uh, oh, damn it. but you know what though? You know, what's cool. I have a daughter that's 23 and one that's just almost 21. The fact that they caught, they said, dad, do you think Corb could get us tickets to his show? I mean, that's gotta be to know for you to know that there's 20 college kids that really want to come see you. That's fun. That, that's cool. That's the re that's my, re my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Shelby, my daughter, Shelby was in the truck that night. We were singing Dan Seals. So. Was she? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think she was in the front seat. Maybe not. You're yeah. Right. I, is that, I, that, I have to admit that night's a bit foggy. Yeah, you were. I'm not sure you cared who was in the truck. You were in the back seat. <laughs> I had, I think it was Wacy, was it Wacy Anderson and, and you, I had two Canadians in the back seat in Las Vegas, controlling the playlist in my pickup. One of That's the most right, unique yeah. drives I've ever had in my life. So, uh, listen, I, I, I oh, was really nervous playing on the dirt and playing in the arena that, that last year, that was, that was the highlight of, my, of one of my highlights of my career. That was fun. Yeah. You sang a whiskey, a whiskey drinking song. Am I, right? whiskey, yeah. I got to tell you, I, at, at the Wrangler national finals, they drop a stage down and people just sing. And a lot of times it's like, great. You gave a guy a chance. I don't necessarily agree with how those, the consistency of those openings and their choices, 
you got as big a response as any artist I've ever heard in the opening at the Wrangler NFR. Because again, you know what you did? You connected with every person in that arena. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I was nervous about that, but it went pretty well. Did did you put, were you guys live, vocals live? Did you play to a track or were all your instruments live? The vocals were live. They don't, it's too, the, the logistics of too having much. a live band or too, they run it too quick to do that. Yeah. So it was a track, but it was, it was live vocals. Yeah. And actually, I actually, my band wasn't in town. So the guys, the guys, playing along to the track behind me where a band from Idaho called the Reckless Kelly. <laughs> I borrowed world. Oh, Reckless friends. Kelly. I know them. Yeah. They were in town <laughs> that night. So I borrowed them to come and come and play the track for me. Did they know this? Cause you should kind of know. Did they oh, know yeah, they, it's not, yeah. They figured it out. They did a good job actually. <laughs> but with all the pyro, with all the pyro and stuff, I'm not sure anybody really noticed too much. Yeah. It's like George Strait. all the lights and all the smoke. Hell, I, I, what'd he say well, on pure country? Yeah, you're. I can't. It's been a while, but you're right about that. Yeah. Um, I was. Well, I had the option to sing live or not, and I. I definitely wanted to sing it live, yeah. especially the be the beginning part, the rye whiskey, rye whiskey, rye whiskey. I cried. That was the fun. That's fun to sing live. Well, when you come on my show, uh, my friend Kurt Blake, who helps with my show, he asks every artist if they can sing rye whiskey or the castration of the yellow stud. That's his two requests. So yeah. you're the only one. <laughs> You're the only one that can do that. Uh, listen, I know you got to get on the van or the bus or whatever. That's I promised you I would not keep you long enough where, where your your band left you. So yeah, what, time, what time is it? It's about time. It's about okay. you. You got to get going. Listen, buddy. I I just appreciate you all through the years. I know a lot of like you said, a lot of our friendship is is on air, but it's real that we never just do an interview. It's a bullshit session. It's a it's knocking ideas back and forth and I appreciate it. I, I think it's, I love what you do. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, me too, man. It's, it's, it's been fun to get to know you over the years. Hey, I want to ask you, what's your favorite, what are your favorite rodeo songs? Um, my number one is probably, I can still make Cheyenne. Yeah. George Strait. Uh, yeah. that one much too young to feel this damn old because it's, uh, it, it's kind of that first one. And, and I love the story. Ned Ledoux on this show told the story of he was riding as a kid with his dad in the pickup and he just had the radio on real low and he heard some, a reference to yeah. rodeo and he said, Chris Ledoux turned the radio up, which he never did. And the next line was a worn out tape of Chris Ledoux and he didn't know he didn't. Really? It, and he went, Oh, 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 and then they became great friends with Garth Ned, Brooks. Ned was in the truck for that. Ned was in the truck. He was like 12 years old. I got to ask him about that. Yeah. And and so that warms my heart. And that's a real connection. Well, and Garth went out of his way to help. I think, I think, I think Garth helped uh, Chris get uh, a record deal or something, didn't he? He, he, well, he, he elevated him. I know, I don't know all the specific, but Hey, I'll, I'll tell you a lot. And then I'll let you go a line from an old Chris Ledoux, not mainstream radio. When he first had all the cassettes. And every year when I go to Oklahoma City, I sing it. In Oklahoma City, there's a building of concrete. It's where the toughest stocking men will gather and compete. And he sings that whole song about uh, Oklahoma City. And the other one is uh, Photo Finish, which Ned sang on my show, where the trip down through Wyoming to get to Cheyenne. Anyway, there you, you know, go. You know, you know, Under Western Skies? Uh, yes, I do know that song. Yes, that's the one. Will Will do Ned's brother told me that's like the most polite "screw you" to Nashville ever written. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's basically it's basically like saying y'all show up and make the records in in Tennessee, but I prefer to live in Wyoming on the ranch. It's yeah. very very polite, but yeah, yeah, oh, thanks, that's awesome. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, what, the reason I asked you though, I wanted to ask you, but what's your relationship with Bandy the Rodeo Clown? You must like that song. Oh, well, I'm, and here's the great thing. I'm glad you asked. I'm, I've become very good friends with Mo Bandy. Okay. And the funny thing here, see now you, you, I'll tell you the story. The funny thing about that song is through the years, Mo Bandy told me he would have people come up and a guy would come up and say, man, you saved my life in Cheyenne. You saved, or my dad loves you because he was hung up one time and you jumped in there and saved his life. And Mo Bandy never, ever was a rodeo clown. He just yeah. had a song about yeah. you know, the tears on my makeup melt my painted smile into a frown. Yeah. What an amazing exactly. line. 
but Mo Bandy, he, so for years he'd come to PBRs and I'd look in the crowd and I'd look at him and he'd go next in, he was next in line to come in and fight bulls in the arena. And he never yeah. was a rodeo clown. So great yeah, song. Great. Good tune though, right? Oh my I like God. Uh, who, who, who keeps the pint out, hit out behind shoot number shoot one. Number one, the <laughs> old school rodeo clown reference. Like we joke about it in the, the bullfighter locker room that we drink coffee and, and we're like, not like it used to be. <laughs> there was more, there was more going in the bullfighter room back in the old days. Than well, now. I remember, I remember when I was a kid following my dad around when he was bulldog and things were a lot more loose than they are now. Cause guys are working out and, thinking about fitness and but in the old yeah. days it was smokes and whiskey you know like <laughs> yeah see i should have let you just interview me damn it i get it i yeah i can interview you easy i should have an interview show I, I like to do that stuff all right well next time you're on my show in vegas i'll let you interview me let's Deal? do that I'll, okay I'll, can i sit at the desk yeah you can sit at, you can sit in my chair and i'll switch <laughs> okay let's let's do that <laughs> okay <laughs> Hey, listen, good luck uh, on the rest of the tour. Have fun in Montana. Let me know how it goes, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? Yeah, thanks, buddy. Take care. Thanks, bud. Okay.